Okay. Um, so I'm just going to introduce Miriam. She Ravner from MJS, um, and she'll tell you a little bit about herself and and everything that you need to know. The way we're going to run things today is pretty much the way we typically do, right? Which is that Miriam will do her presentation. If you have questions that can't wait, put them in the chat. If I see something that's really super critical, I'll I'll speak up. If not, we'll cover those questions or comments after Miriam's presentation. And then obviously we'll open up the mics and anyone can ask anything they want. Does that seem okay? We're done with that. All right. So Miriam, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to RSS, to Margie, to Selena, to Julie mm -hmm. for inviting myself, Miriam, and my colleague Rosie, who is in transit, but will join us. We both work for MJHS Hospice and Palliative Care. I see now that I have a typo in the chat. I don't want you to be scared by the words hospice and palliative care. You could see we're alive and well and lively and productive. And the reason that I'm coming to talk to you today via Zoom, and I was in the center, uh, in the central building on Tuesday, is really that we want to talk about living living now and living for as long as we can in the most productive, meaningful, fulfilling, and healthy way. But we also have to think about the certainty that all of us will decline and that all of us will eventually die. Um, we hope it's not for a long time. And we hope that while we are alive, that we can function and, and find meaning and do the things that we want to do with gusto, with joy, with satisfaction, with fulfillment, and with success. When I talk about planning for the future, I'm really talking about my show, your show for each one of you. It is something that you have to really consider in the privacy of your home and probably within yourself and have conversations with yourself about how you would like the end of your life to look like. Now, we don't know when that will be. As I said, we hope it's far off, but we try to plan and to manage whatever we can manage. And I'm very well aware that life is capricious and that Things can happen on the flip of a coin or very, very quickly and may not play out the way we want to, but we should try to prepare and to think about what we would want and to make those wishes known to people who care about us, who love us, people whom we are professionally connected with, our caregivers, our doctors, our geriatric care managers, and our spiritual care providers. So when the time comes, we don't find ourselves into a, in a crisis. And very often the time comes, and we saw that with COVID, in the most unexpected time, and you don't have to be 70 or 75 or even 80 to plan ahead. Uh, COVID taught us that, um, terrible things, illness can happen to anybody, no matter how old you are. And if we are completely unprepared, we will be in a very intense emergency situation, whether we are aware of it or whether we are so ill that we can't even make our wishes know where we can't even speak. And so the first conversation that I want you to urge to have is with yourself. It's a scary thought to think about our leaving, okay? Nobody goes there with joy and with pleasure. But we're adults and it's inevitable. And so the conversation that I am recommending to you and I'm empowering you to have and I encourage you to have is with yourself. And it's not a one and done. You don't just think about it once and say, okay, I know what I want and that's it. You revisit it. And every time that I revisit it, it gets a little bit easier. And when do I revisit it? I revisit it at a milestone birthday. That's a good opportunity. 
I revisit it when I watch somebody die. And I said to myself, this is not how I want it to play out for myself. Or I revisit it when there is a life change, when there is um, a divorce, or there is uh, a terrible diagnosis that we have to deal with. And we revisit it also as we age, because what I plan for myself at 60 is going to change for sure when I'm 70 and 75. And so these conversations and ultimately the decisions that I'm going to talk about how we document our wishes and our decisions can and should be revisited as we age. And it's very easy to do. Um, you just think about it and you see it from a different angle. It's still the end result is going to be the same. We're going to be leaving this earth and there is sadness involved with it and maybe regret but maybe also a kind of relief. I know it's going to come and I'm prepared for it. And I want you to, I want to help you to prepare for it. Having this conversation strengthens us as individuals and it strengthens our relationships that we have with others. If we're lucky enough to have family, it will bring us closer. It will avoid conflict. It will avoid um, conversations that are unpleasant if, if we manage them properly and start them early. And I find that having these conversations, whether they are internal or with a circle of people who love us, are a holy space. And in a way, as frightening as, 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 as it might be and as tentative as we might enter it, it is also very, very rewarding and holds a lot of value. So the first conversation with ourselves, as I said, um, is scary. And we try to delay and to deny and to avoid. Why? Oh, because we're afraid. We are all, we are all human after all, okay? I hear a voice, so if somebody could um, maybe mute themselves, that would be helpful. And if we don't have these conversations and we don't plan ahead, we end up in a crisis situation. And I'm looking at some of you, I see the little frames of you, Nobody here joined us today as a teenager. We're all of a certain age, right? And so I might want to remind you about Nancy Cruzan in the 1990s or Karen Ann Quinlan in 1985, if you remember that case where these two young women, Nancy and Karen, fell ill very unexpectedly and prematurely. And they did not have their wishes expressed and documented. And the family started to fight over what should we do with her. The doctors said she they are um, never going to regain consciousness in a in a meaningful way. They're in a vegetative state. The husband said, "My wife would not want to live like that, and we need to let her go." And the parents said, no, we love our daughter. And sometimes she responds to us or she squeezes our hand. We want to keep her alive. And this all played out in the media, on television and in, in the newspapers. It was a horrible tragedy for each family, not just the impending loss, but the, the visibility and the loss of dignity for the patients. And that's what we do don't want. And that's why I'm meeting with you today, so that we never come into a situation where we at least haven't tried to make our wishes known. Also, putting our families in a crisis-making decision is burdensome. It's unfair. And it puts a tremendous pressure on them to make quick decisions when you are, for example, in an emergency room or when you are at home and you're passed out. And not everybody is equipped to make these decisions under duress. And they're especially not equipped to make them if they don't know what your wishes are. So 
unless you voice your wishes and unless you document them, nobody will be able to speak on your behalf when you have no longer a voice and only when you're no longer able to speak for yourself. Because as long as you're competent and you can speak, you will speak for yourself and you'll tell the doctor, this is not what I want or this is what I want. But you have to select somebody who can speak on your behalf when you can no longer speak. And so once you have decided what you want, and once you have informed yourself and researched what kind of technological um, interventions are available to keep you alive, then you can make sound decisions that reflect your values, your religious beliefs, your traditions, your overall wishes, and the meaning that you are finding in life so that it is reflected also in your passing. Um, it's an obligation. I'm placing an obligation on you. We're not just getting together because uh, we want to meet. It, I'm urging you and I'm here to support you. And I put all my contact information in the chat room and the people at RSS are available to those of you who are members and who go and visit um, on a daily or on a regular basis. So how we live, that's how we probably want to die. And so the first question is, what gives my life meaning? And as I said before, that changes as we age. So reassess every once in a while, but now don't wait too long and take the time. And start thinking, say, the lady said I should. Or if you have already placed your wishes in a document, or you've already discussed it with friends or family members, you might want to reassess. You know, might want to say, what I said five years ago doesn't really resonate with me anymore. I want to change it. And you need to have what I, care, help, what I call healthcare literacy. You need to know what interventions are available. Do I want to have dialysis three times a week if my kidneys fail? If I can no longer eat and enjoy food, do I want to be fed through a feeding tube in my belly? That's a little surgical procedure. Do I want um, to have a ventilator, a tube that's inserted in, through my mouth and throat, and that will breathe for me? You'll be sedated for it because it's uncomfortable, but it's your choice and it's your right. <coughs> as this is our right as patients. But those are the kind of questions that you should ask yourself and answer as honestly as you can. And if you need advice, speak to your doctor. The doctors must make time to have these conversations with us. I know that doctors nowadays have exactly seven minutes to meet with us during the visit. But if we tell them ahead of time, we would like to have a conversation about end of life planning, they will make the time. If you have a spiritual care advisor or supporter, speak with him because religious beliefs may play a big role also. If you have a geriatric care manager, if you have a friend whom you feel close to, who you feel can, you can consult with, reach out to them and have the conversations. And if you have family, discuss it. Now I'll tell you from my own experience, when I wanted to discuss it, my children were late teenagers. My oldest son did not want to hear it. He kept covering his ears and saying, la, 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 la. I don't want to talk to you about this. It was scary. And I finally said to him, you got to sit down. It says in the Bible, you got to honor mom and dad. And I'm asking this of you now. It's time to grow up. I am well. I am healthy. But I want to discuss certain things with you. And they're now, my oldest son is 40. So I have revisited with him. But I've had the conversations. The conversation that we have with ourselves is hard. And then how do we bring it to people who love us? The topic is heavy. And the topic is one about an eternal separation where we're gonna to have to make our farewell. 
And so it's okay to cry. It's also okay to have a glass of wine to take the edge off. And I always say that people think I'm going to make alcoholics out of everybody. Um, Thanksgiving time, when we're getting together, it's not just about the turkey and the yams. If you want to have a one hour conversation with family members, now is the time to have the conversation. Tell them, this is what I thought about. I spoke to my doctor. I did some research. This is what I want. And so some of the assembled will say, that's not what you should be doing. And I, and I don't agree. And so while we're well, and I have a voice, and we still have a position and stature within our circle of family or friends, we can mediate that and we can mitigate it and we can explain why this is what we want and that we have uh, thought about alternatives. But in the end, it's our show and we are asking everybody to come on board and to support us. And as a parent, or as a grandparent, was an aunt, an uncle, or a very good friend. It's our role to tell people, take a deep breath, think about it. Don't attack somebody in this group. Don't attack me for what I want. Everybody can make decisions freely. And I'm asking you to please support my decisions. Once you've had that conversation, and people are more or less if they're not on board, they're respectful. Then you have to think, who will be your healthcare surrogate? Who is going to speak for you among all the assembled or among your circle of friends or friends in the church or friends in, in a book club who, whom you can ask to be an agent for you should you no longer have a voice and only when you have no longer a voice. And that's a tough decision to make. You don't want to pick somebody who is 10 years older than you, because if the laws of nature play out normally, that person might die before you or might uh, have a touch of dementia or get chronically ill. Look backwards to somebody who is a bit younger. If you have family members, consider who is the one who can make a good decision for me representing me in crisis time. If you have people who love you, if you have children or grandchildren, don't necessarily select the one you're closest to because the person who's closest to you might be so emotionally tied to you that he or she does not want to necessarily let you go. And I know this from my son, whom I was going to make my oldest son, my healthcare agent, and when I explained everything and everybody was nodding and I had tears and my husband was there and my sister and my older son said, mom, don't worry. I'm going to unplug you once they plug you in. And I looked at him and I said, I don't want to be plugged in. That's why we're having this conversation. I do not want to have a machine breathing for me. And once you unplug me, that's a criminal act on your part. And, and I, I knew then that he could not be my healthcare agent because he was so tied to me emotionally, he would not be able to let me go under my terms. And so I picked my younger son. And of course there were some hurt feelings, but I was well enough and I was running this conversation and I explained what my considerations were and why I, I chose the younger one. So once you have selected somebody you think, my niece or my best friend who is younger or my college roommate or my daughter might be the right person who could speak for me, you have to speak to them. You have to ask, do you want to take on this responsibility? It's a holy responsibility, but it's still a responsibility. Will you be able to act and to speak on my behalf? And sometimes it's going to be quick decision making if you're in an emergency or in an emergency room. Will you be able to do it? And if that person whom you've selected agrees, then that person will become your healthcare agent, a surrogate for you, 
and you're going to name that person in a healthcare proxy. The proxy is the document. The person is the agent. The New York State healthcare proxies are on the internet. You can just type in or have someone who is computer savvy type in New York State healthcare proxy and it can be downloaded and can be printed. And you name that person and maybe an alternate, another person. Because what if my daughter whom I named happens to be at, in Cairo and in Egypt on a sightseeing trip to the pyramids and can't be reached. So try to think of an alternate, a second person who could be there in case the first person cannot be reached. And you fill out your healthcare proxy form. It does not have to be notarized. It needs to be witnessed by two witnesses who are not nominated as your agent, okay? So I can be a witness if I were to meet you or anybody at the center, a neighbor could be a witness, but you have to document who your healthcare agent is. And I left some little cards, healthcare proxy cards with Selena at the, at the center, the RSS center. They are wallet size. You can fill them out. You can name the one or two people who can speak on your behalf should you be incapacitated. And it can be temporary, or it could be unfortunately forever. And again, two witnesses will say, yes, I saw Miriam sign it. She was competent. She knew what she was doing when she signed it. And these cards can go in your wallet. They can go in your phone holder. They can travel with you wherever you go. And it's very good to have because my mother-in-law went to BJ's, you know, that big supermarket store, and she didn't feel well. And she sat down on her walker, and she had enough strength and her wits about her to call 911. But then she lost consciousness, and she was no longer competent. And good Samaritans and then EMT people came and looked in her wallet. And she had this card filled out and the emergency contact, the agent was listed and they called him and said, we are taking Mrs. XYZ to this and this emergency room. Would, can you meet us there? Because she listed you as the agent. And so that's what happens. So the cards are not heavy. It's not a big document that you have to carry around and um, it will say the same thing. So please ask for it, download it, fill it out. Once you've named a healthcare agent, it's wise to share this document with the person you've nominated, obviously, with family members and with your physician. And those of you who are part of a hospital system where uh, everything is electronically stored in your chart, can bring it on the next visit and say, I filled it out and I want it to go into my electronic chart. So whenever you go, whether you're going to see your pulmonologist or your cardiologist or your um, nephrologist, they all look in the same chart and they will all see who your healthcare agent is. Um, if you have questions, please write them down and I will address them afterwards. Um, I want to discuss another document with you. Uh, it is called the Five Wishes. I'm going to hold it up. It is also the, on the internet, the Five Wishes, and it is a living will kind of a document. And the Five Wishes that it addresses are, and I'm going to read them soon are phrased in such a gentle, but yet very wise way that they give us an impetus to think about something. And that's why we recommend it. We also recommend it because the five wishes are accepted in about 47 states of the United States. So if you happen to go to Florida for three months or to California for six months to visit, 
it will be accepted there, even though you might have filled it out in New York City, New York State. So that's a wonderful thing to know that there is reciprocity. Um, the five wishes that this document addresses and throws out at us to consider are, who is the person I want to make I want to make care decisions for me when I can no longer do so. So that we just discussed is the healthcare agent. The kinds of medical treatment that I do want and the ones that I don't want. And it allows you to handwrite it. It puts in some of the technological interventions that are possible. You can Hello. check off, yes, I would want that, or cross thing. out what is not relevant, what you to want to reject. I love it because I give you sparkling water. And then it's time to set up the prices. We do bingo. The third question is, how comfortable do I want to be? And that is a very important question. If we have pain, do we want the pain to be managed? even if we're going to be loopy or sleeping a lot? Or would we rather feel some of our pain and still interact with family, with friends, with the television, with an aide whom we trust, with neighbors? So it, it allows you to think how much you want to have relief for and how much you're willing to tolerate. How do I want people to treat me? What is the name that I want to be called? Should they call me Miriam or should they call me Miss Ravner? Am I a woman? Do I identify as a woman? I do. So I want the pronouns to be she and not he. Um, do I want to be in a hospital gown when I am frail and weak? Or do I want to be in my own pajamas and nightgown? Do I want someone to do my nails? So that even though I'm not what I used to be, I'm not as vibrant and vital as in the good old days, I still want to look groomed. I want my hair to be done. I want to be shaved if I'm a man. I like to have a little spritz of aftershave or of cologne. I would like my eyebrows to be um, plucked. Nothing is too silly and nothing is frivolous. As I said before, it's our show. We can record it. Do I want to have music in my room? Do I not want to have? Do I like silence? Would I appreciate it if somebody read poetry or the newspaper to me? All these things are for us to decide while we can still decide them and to document them. And then the last question is, what do I want my loved ones to know about me? And that's a very kind of uplifting question. It allows us to leave a legacy or to share a secret or to apologize for something or to make amends, to reconcile, to explain something or to say, you know, the charm that I've always worn around my neck was my mom's. And I wanted to go to the first born grandchild or the first born cousin or uh, my friend's first born daughter. So there are things that we can leave. We can say, I always made a wonderful cake. Here is the recipe. It is for us to leave a legacy. It could be spiritual, it could be traditional, it can be frivolous, it can be a reminiscence, a memory that we haven't shared and we want to share it now so that people can remember us by and be uplifted in the memory that they have of us. So I've talked a lot and I will just mention one more document before I'm gonna take your questions. This is probably the hardest document that I'm going to discuss, and I don't have it in front of me. It is called the DNR. It is an order to 
do not resuscitate. It gives us the power to decide when our body fails us, our heart most probably, whether we want just to be kept comfortable and to meet our end as peacefully as possible with no medical interventions, or do we want heroic measures to, to pump our heart either by hand, CPR, or with a machine with a shock and keep us going? The DNR order is very often tied to religious beliefs and it is a tough decision for many people to make. So think about it. If you are in a hospital nowadays, even if you go for foot surgery that has nothing to do with end of life, and when they admit you and they prep you, they're gonna ask you, please fill out the DNR in case something happens, okay? That DNR, that do not resuscitate order is only valid while you're in the hospital, whether it's an ambulatory intervention like I had for my foot surgery, or whether you're there because you had um, uh, a kidney episode or whether you had um, a, a terrible infection that needed to be administered to and, and, and overseen in the hospital. The DNR in a hospital is only valid while you're in a hospital. It is not gonna travel with you when you go to the rehab center or when you come home, please God. So if you want to have a DNR at home, you have to tell your doctor or the physician assistant, I want to have a DNR for my home. And that DNR needs to be reevaluated and signed by a doctor every 90 days. That was a question that came up on Tuesday, and I did not know exactly how long it's valid for, but I did some research in New York State. It's valid for 90 days. And don't put it in a drawer. Don't put any of these um, documents in a drawer where nobody can find them or with all the tablecloths that, that are lying in the closet. A DNR should be visible. It should be held on the refrigerator or sometimes even in a bedroom so that everybody who takes care of you, it could be an aide or it could be EMS if somebody calls 911 for you. The, the EMS people by law have to start um, resuscitating you unless there is a DNR, a do not resuscitate order visible to them, right? So the DNR order, it is a tough order, but it can be revoked. You can say next month, yeah, I don't want any interventions. And then your hands, you said, I thought about it. My granddaughter is going to graduate from college and I want to live to see it. My best friend's son is getting married. I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to live as long as I can, even with medical interventions. I'm not signing any document. I'm going to try to live as, pos as long as possible. So um, those are the documents that I wanted to discuss with you. And I wanted to tell you that we often, with ourselves and with loved ones, be they family, blood family, family of choice, circles of good friends. We have this conspiracy of silence. We don't want to bring up. It's a heavy topic. It's difficult. Why would I ruin the mood? But when we bring it up, most people feel relief. It's finally out on the open. And I'll tell you from my own experience, my mother-in-law turned 90, 90. That's a nice age. And my son asked me, mom, who is going to jump in if something happens to grandma? And I said, I have no idea. I would never ask her. That's my mother-in-law. Ask dad. That's her son. And so her son and her grandson took her out for dinner. And my son, the younger generation, doesn't have so many taboos like we do. Say, grandma. I mean, I hope you live a long, healthy life, but what if something were to happen to you, God forbid, God forbid, poo, poo, poo. Who is going to make the decisions for you? And my mother-in-law clapped her hand and said, well, 
finally someone is asking me and wants to know about it. I thought nobody cares and nobody's interested. So she didn't want to bring it up because she felt we couldn't handle it or we don't care enough. We didn't want to bring it up because we don't want to hasten death as many superstitious people feel. So nobody spoke about it. And this big elephant was in the room. And every time she came up from Florida to visit us, I'm thinking, I hope nothing happens to her while she's with us. I don't know what her wishes are. And finally, my son brought it up. And a few days later, she uh, went to an elder care attorney and she took care of her documents and she distributed to all her children and grandchildren her documents. And she selected her healthcare agent and a sigh of relief was, uh, was experienced by all of us. And you know what? We could enjoy the time with her. We didn't have to, we all were informed. We didn't have to worry. <gasps> what if this happens? What if that happened? And she lived another five plus years, thank God. So you don't hasten that by talking about it. So now I'm gonna look quickly at the chat. I see that my colleague, Rosie Bernard has joined us and she put something in the chat. There was only one question about, um, is you know if you you have your um practice out of live side of town right suggested to select somebody else who might be closer um right. you can leave that person who's out of town just to clarify just as someone else um who lives closer to you um could be a friend a it's, family member um especially your faith leader yeah yeah it's well, easier we if we're in the same or similar time zone. I tell him, I, I, you can hear that I have an accent. I was born and raised in Switzerland and my father lived his entire life in Switzerland and died in Switzerland. And I was his healthcare person. And it was a six hour time difference. So uh, I was always nervous. What if I go to sleep and they're gonna call me in the middle of the night, of course, I would answer the call and I was prepared for it, but you're not as clear. So I asked one of my cousins who lived in the same town to be um, also a healthcare agent so that they could contact, if there was an emergency, someone who lived in town in the same time zone who knew him well and who knew how he would want uh, things to proceed. The other thing I want to tell you, if you select somebody and you have these conversations with yourself first and then with the family and when the end comes and your surrogate your agent speaks for you your family will grieve better because they'll know that they honored your wishes they won't be this oh my god did i do right by mom my aunt uh, it didn't tell me exactly. I don't know if I made the right decision. If everything has been discussed and documented and explained, it helps those whom we leave behind, be they friends, family of choice, family, birth families. It comforts them. There is no second guessing. There is no fighting. Oh, yeah, well, you wanted you wanted her to die for the last five years. That's not true. I loved her as much as you did. No, we followed the wishes of the patient, and we're all on the same page. And that is, I think, a comfort to us that we're going to leave them united. And it certainly is a comfort to those who we leave. There's another question in the um, chat. Yeah, there, there, you don't need an elder care lawyer to change a healthcare person. You just take the old healthcare um, document that you have, the proxy form. You either take a Sharpie or a very strong pen. You write revoke on it, or you can even tear it up and you fill out the new one and update it in your folder, in a visible folder and give it to the doctor and say, I changed my mind. I selected somebody else. This is my new one. And that's it. You do not need an attorney. You don't need a notary. Keep the original, Keep, um, give copies to whoever you want to give copies to, whoever had the old version, make sure that they have the new version um, and keep the original to yourself. 
and be generous when you distribute it. Be generous, let everybody have it so that you're covering yourself. Um, my neighbor knows, uh, my family knows, my doctor knows, my, my priest knows, my rabbi knows, my geriatric care manager knows, my aide knows. Be generous, so, so have, have the original in your house, but distribute it. So I have a question. So, um, you know, we've often been told that you should put on your like refrigerated door the list of your medications and, and that kind of stuff so that if many times something happens, especially if you live alone, that's an emergency, EMS comes in. Is that something like how does, yes, I could give it to my doctor, but if I have an emergency, it could no, be in the middle of the night for so you should have it in your house in a very prominent place where the EMS yeah. can see it. Yes, okay. I went to someone's house. There. I, I went to someone's house and they had a little plastic folder. As I entered the, the, the little foyer, it was not a big apartment. They had it there for all to see. It had a list of medication, exactly just like you asked. It had a DNR order <laughs> and it had a, a, healthcare pro a copy of the healthcare proxy in there. So whoever came, EMS or a doctor who made a house call or a concerned relative or a hired aide, they knew what to do and whom to call. And it's very, the more information you share within the privacy of, of, of your abode, your room or your, your apartment, the better it is. Other questions from people? lot to think about, I guess. It's a lot to think about. So um, I put my information, as I said, in the chat. Sometimes when we wash our hair or um, we do the dishes, a question comes up all of a sudden and we can't find a good response to it. Feel free to email me or to even call me. I'm quite responsive. That's part of my Swiss upbringing. And I will get back to you. And of course, it's confidential. And if I don't have an answer, I'm going to do my best to ask in our offices for my colleagues to get the right information and to give it to you. And if you have a specific concern that I could help you with, or if you want to run something past me, I'm thinking about this person or this person, what do you think? I'll be happy to put in my two cents and to help you along in your decision-making process. Also, well, one of the things Miriam and I were talking about prior to just starting here today was perhaps um, Miriam and Rosie or whatever the combination would be, would come to the center and also have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and possibly even work with people on some of these documents also. So that's something we're gonna work with Selena um, at setting up so that people can come in. Are there other? Questions, comments? Well, uh, Brenda, just unmute yourself. Miss, Miss Brenda has to unmute herself. Yeah, Brenda, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, I just okay. want to know. Get it, yay. Not me, yay. <laughs> what does MJHS stand for? MJHS stands for Metropolitan Jewish Health System. I don't know if you used to hear our commercial, it ran a few years ago, about four Brooklyn ladies who started our organization over a hundred years ago in Brooklyn, obviously, to take care of people who had nobody to help them, who uh, might not have had financial resources, and they started this as a mission of compassion and support within their own community. I'm one of the ladies. I look good for 110. Don't I look good? Um, the mission has remained the same. And we have grown. We have uh, two nursing homes. We offer hospice care, palliative care. We offer health plans. We are a very, very large health system. But as you could see. So also, aren't you a not-for-profit? We're all not-for-profit. Right. And as you could see, just we're not in this for money. 
we're in this with the same mission of empowering people, of accompanying people, of helping people make good decisions. And people often say to me, oh, isn't it sad what you're doing? Do I look sad and depressed? Nah. No, it's, it's an honor and it's a privilege. And that's what we do. And um, I'm available to you or to come to the center again with Rosie. Rosie is fluent in both English and Spanish. So if there are people who are more comfortable, I'm fluent in French and Italian and Yiddish as well. So we can meet people where they're at. And, and filling out your documents does not bring about yeah. illness or death. On the contrary, the other superstition is in Jewish tradition that it um, ensures for a long life. And that's what I wish for all of you and for me as well, of course, a healthy and productive and fulfilling life. Right, and we have to know, where do you get the DNR forms? Your doctor has to initiate it and has to sign it. So you can ask your doctor. Okay. Yeah, probably you online to too, but it has to be signed by a physician. So uh, they, they, most of the physicians or the receptionists have it, but it is online also. In my parents' generation, which was like early 1900s um, to 1970s, the Hemlock Society was something that, they spoke of. Does, is that still something viable? Does it exist? Is it out of fashion? What was that? It's not, I don't know if it's still called the Hemlock Society. It is end of life choices is one of the, of the organizations that is advocating very much to allow people to make their own choices. It is it's lobbying in, in Albany uh, to allow physician-assisted death, suicide, so to speak. Um, it is illegal in New York City, in New York State. It is not something that we do. Even when our patients become very ill and need morphine every hour, a drop of morphine, it's titrated and we've had, I've been doing this for 18 years. I've had family members begging me, give my father a large dose of morphine. We don't do that. We let nature take its course. It needs to take its course. Will we help with medication? Yes, but we will never, never assist in hastening death. It's not, it's illegal. In, in New York State. Thank you. It was really the old days, so I wondered, you know, what that was. Yes. Thank you for explaining. I never knew. Thanks. Hi, Miriam. Somebody what? has a question. Sorry, I apologize. I used. I okay. see. How is competency to make choices determined? It's a great question. I'm not a physician. Um, there are tests that they give you. Any primary care physician, certainly a neurologist, and maybe a primary physician will refer you to a neurologist. There are standard tests, and they ask you, one of the questions is, uh, do you know the date? Uh, who is the current president? Other questions, and a, a physician, a clinician will make that decision uh, for you. Now, once you are deemed not competent, it's hard then to, to fill out a document and um, physicians and attorneys and family members are very concerned that nobody be forced, even though they're not fully competent anymore to, to write something. So it's not a good idea to wait too long. And that's why I'm urging you, you all came on. That means you're competent and you're asking questions and you're unmuted yourself, Ms. Brenda. Um, do it while you're still thinking clearly, because once you are no longer competent, it will not be accepted. The witnesses will have to say, I can't in good conscience sign that Miriam was competent when she, when she wrote out this stuff. So do it now. 
and change if you have to. Nothing is engraved. You know what's engraved in stone? Our tombstone. That's what's mm -hmm. going to be engraved in stone. Until then, nothing is engraved in stone. We get opportunities to change our mind. Some of the, Sometimes we have to change our mind because we're disappointed in someone. But we have the opportunity to still do it. And that's also a sense of freedom and independence to be able to change our own mind. That's great. No question. Anything Somebody else? wrote, I recently updated my papers. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And I feel good that most of decisions are done. <laughs> All right. I'm, I, I applaud you. Bravo. And it says, I've gotten additional thoughts from today's presentation. And I'm grateful for that. And I take that as a compliment. Both Rosie and I always feel gratitude when we bring up a point that resonates with someone. So thank you for sharing that. I have a question. Yes. Um, with Zoom, uh, with COVID, so much was done by Zoom. For healthcare proxy, um, at say there's a family member that's going to be an alternate that lives in another state, but the primary is here. Um, how, how is the witness situation done? Can you bring that person up on Zoom and everybody? So I did it with an attorney. That person that's out of state or do you have to do it with an attorney? So I did it with an attorney. I read it everything. I did my financial testament. I, I, I did everything. And, you know, it was the height of COVID and the attorney brought two witnesses on Zoom. And I was on, on Zoom in my house and they, they, they were able to do it on Zoom. Um, to tell you the truth, if you want to do it yourself, I'm not quite sure uh, how I would think that, yes, somebody can be on Zoom and witness it for you. But I, if you have an elder care attorney or if you have somebody, well, I could try to find out for you and, and, and get back to you. It, it's a great question and I didn't think about it. We often also get asked, and this may not be something that you have, for lists of good elder care attorneys, do you have yes. places that could be Yes, referred? so we have, we are not allowed to, and we should not right. just right. send you to one, right. but we have a list of elder care attorneys with whom uh, our patients have worked and have been very, very satisfied and whose fees were not exorbitant and who didn't start, you should be doing this and beginning that. And all of a sudden it's thousands right. of dollars that we have no intention or ability to pay. Right. That was not even related to our initial concern. It just be brought in. Mm -hmm. So I can share with you yep. um, some of the names where, where people have been very satisfied and felt that their needs were, were met uh, and not more. And no other stuff was brought up. Oh, you should be doing this or doing that. That's perfect. That would be very appreciated. That's great. I make myself a note. You really didn't have your question and her answer. Yeah, it's up here. <laughs> Thank you. Change. Oh. Did, did, did you change something else? Sorry. I just want to make. Did we, Juanita, did we finish with your question? Juanita. Yes, that was, okay. that was great. That okay. was great. And okay. the presentation is wonderful. And yes, it feels wonderful to have it done. <laughs> I, just wanted to know, yeah, yeah. Ellie, I have a quick question. I have to go over to my doctor and, and see what I wrote. Brenda, 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 what... Brenda, somebody was, ask, was asking a question. So let them ask the question, then we'll come back to you because they okay. were, had already started talking. Thank you. A quick question. If you change doctors, did each doctor have to do the ENR? Does it, or the, the DNR, or does it go in your chart and it's good for whatever doctor you go to? I would say it depends on the system. So if you're changing doctors with a different office, different system, then uh -huh. you may want to give a new DNR. Okay, thank if you. If you're in the okay. same system, you probably may not have to, but you still may want to double check. 
good point. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful presentation, by the way. Just wonderful. Thank you so much. Who thought of these? Who could think of this? And I just want to suggest um, to Brenda, you said you want to check what you wrote um, with your doctor. If you complete it again, which probably might be a good suggestion for you to, you know, do it again at the healthcare proxy, um, for example, keep the original yourself. Give the doctor a copy, okay? You make sure that you have the original. Yeah, so never, which is always, true. always have the original or a very good copy in your Correct. record. Mm -hmm. So you can revisit it. All of a sudden you say, oh, this Miriam woman said something. Oh, let me go. So you know where to go. And don't put it in the bank, in the safe deposit box, okay? Because it needs to be accessible. So my dad, may he rest in peace, he left us a big manila envelope and it said on it, exit, E-X-I-T. <laughs> and that was his euphemism for death stuff. But everything was there. The deed to his, to his cemetery plot, uh, a DNR, um, what he wanted to have done, uh, the name of the attorney who had the will, the financial will, everything was in this one envelope and I was very very grateful to him that he had made it so easy and he had showed me when I once went on a visit he said you see this this is when I'm and he couldn't say the word uh, he was a little superstitious and he didn't want to talk about it but when that time comes this is the envelope and then we left it we did not revisit it so I did the same thing I have a big file and I also marked it exit I figured, hey, this is my legacy. I'm taking it from my dad. And, and I show my children and uh, they every time I bring it up, they say, mom, we heard it so many times. We now know, okay? You don't have to bring it up every time we come for Passover or for Thanksgiving. We know, can we not keep discussing it? But I want them to be comfortable with the topic and I want them to know where all the papers are because to make decisions in a crisis is lousy. Mm -hmm. Anything okay, well, else? Yeah, Anything we're, else? We're six o'clock, but we want to make sure if anyone else has any questions. And obviously, if you have questions afterwards, you can send a note to info at rssny.org will make sure that they get to everyone that they should appropriately get to. And obviously Selena is also a resource um, for you in the center. And we will have the recording. And as a matter of fact, I'm also gonna have the transcript because I did the transcript mm -hmm. also. And if you go to the center, if any of you goes and you wanna have the little healthcare proxy card that you could stick in your wallet, in your eyeglass case, in your phone case, Selena has a whole bunch, and uh, she told me to share that with you. So feel free to stop by and ask her for one of those healthcare proxy cards. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to say mm -hmm. thank, thank you. Thanks so else. much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, great. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.